Welcome to the Molding Health Show. Our goal is to leverage the wisdom and experience of healthcare practitioners to set you on a path of self-discovery and healing. These insights, coupled with a multidisciplinary approach to each area of interest, should provide an invaluable resource to everyone looking for a better approach to health. In this episode, we speak to Leslie Burns, an occupational therapist and workplace therapist about mental health and mental illness within the workplace. Leslie Burns, uh, welcome to the show. So we're going to be talking about mental health um, and illness in the workplace. And I have to get that right because you just reminded us before the show about how so many people get it wrong. Welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. As I said, always great to be talking about matters related to mental health and illness in, in the workplace. Uh, hopefully we can make a difference. Okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to this chat a lot. And I think everything has been kind of pointing us in this, in this direction, because we had an educational or oh, counseling psychologist coming and talking to us about burnout. We've had someone recently, an occupational therapist, um, Helen, that spoke to us about sleep management and fatigue and stress management, and how those kind of correlate so well and pain management. Uh, and I thought that's amazing. And uh, Shaz did another amazing job at, you know, connecting with you and getting you on board. So Shaz, how, how did you manage to um, to wrestle Leslie's arm to do that? Um, I didn't actually have to wrestle arm wrestle Leslie too much to get the agreement to join us today. I've been following Leslie for just over a year and a half on LinkedIn, but I think the post that triggered me to actually reach out and say invite her to the show was Leslie put a post out recently with an image of Robin Williams that very much went along the lines of everyone you meet is fighting a battle and you don't know anything about it. So just always be kind. And having just done the interview with about burnout and then sleep management and fatigue, I was really interested in Leslie's perspective on mindfulness and well-being within the workplace. So that's when I sent the invite and Leslie came back almost immediately to say she would love to take part. Thanks, Leslie, for doing that. Um, and we can't just leave it there on that cliffhanger. So maybe let's talk, let's start with that one. Was there a specific reason that you put that out? Uh, was it just the timing of it? The article on burnout. The, mm, the, with, and Robin, Robin Williams. I mean, with the, the article on Robin Williams, yeah. Well, actually, Shaz, it's interesting that you've been following me for a year and a half. Um, <laughs> You, you've probably noticed uh, during, during the last couple of months that I've actually become significantly more active on LinkedIn. Um, and that's actually thanks to a, a marketing team that, I, that I've been working with. Um, uh, we'll talk about that later in the show, but it's been one of my challenges is, is marketing my services. Um, so pre, uh, I'm trying to think now, pre a couple of months ago, I didn't do very much on LinkedIn. Um, and that's probably what led you to now connect with me because I have been, I've learned about LinkedIn. As I said, when the pandemic hit, I was very not savvy when it comes to technology. I'm a therapist. I have been since 1988. So computers are not, were not my thing. Uh, and I've discovered LinkedIn. So it, that's, that's great. I'm glad it's working. And hopefully lots of other people have been uh, picking up on it as well. That particular article, you know, I, ju I just do think that that um, one of the problems I've realized, and we'll talk more about it, is there's a there's a great misunderstanding and when it comes to mental illness, um, and obviously I focus on on the workplace, and and people people are scared of it, and so people tend to avoid it, um, and and the, there are so many people I, I'm sure that are fighting a huge battle, uh, especially at work. Um, and especially even now more so with the COVID pandemic and the job losses and everything that's come with that. Uh, and I just, yeah, I just wrote that article, you know, everyone, or not everyone, but most people of my generation, I think I'm maybe a bit older than you, Shaz, um, probably a bit older than you too, Oliver, um, know Robin Williams. And, and that was such a great tragedy. Uh, and also one of the things I do in my workshops to try and create the awareness of, of of the prevalence of mental illnesses, I use examples of celebrities um, and, and to try and debunk the myth. You know, there's a lot of myths about people with mental illness. They're weak, they're unsuccessful, they're, 
you know, all sorts of negative things. And then you just have to look at people like Robin Williams. I, I wouldn't say that he was unsuccessful. Uh, and many other celebrities, I've got a whole slide of them in one of my presentations, uh, Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, uh, Prince Harry, uh, our very own Trevor Noah. Uh, these are all people of many, many, many more who've spoken about mental illness. And I think it's, I think it's quite a useful way of, of, of getting the message out there. So that was just a very short article on, on and I used him as an example. Uh, I'm glad it caught your eye, Shaz. Mm, you uh, definitely, I mean, we had uh, Helen Room on uh, on a previous episode recently, and she's another superstar when it comes to LinkedIn, also an occupational therapist, uh, but I, I really like that, you know, I, I, we've been preaching about this for years, and, and even as a company, you know, only recently we started getting our content right, because it does take effort, you know, hopefully, you know, you can talk through us, uh, you know, around that, because, you know, like Helen said, there was a, there's a conscious effort that she does, you know, in terms of putting out content and being, you know, and making sure it's applicable and stuff like that, um, which, you know, is fascinating in its own right. But uh, I definitely want to say, yeah, thanks for doing that, because you're showing therapists how it should be done. I think that's how, you know, we've always believed in it. Um, you know, on that point, around business and, you know, like content marketing, uh, someone always told me, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to dig for water in a desert, you know, you want to go where the audience is. And, um, you know, like, so that's how I see LinkedIn and I see, you know, the social media, you know, platforms is rather than putting out a blog and, you know, maybe no one will ever go there. You already have the audience there, you know, connect to them there. That's what they're there. As long as you do it in a, you know, ethical and good way and putting out valuable content and stuff like that. I, I think there's such a huge value, you know, that therapists are probably missing, you know, by not doing it. That's just my take on it. Um, yeah. But uh, I like what you said about the celebrities. And the reason I like that is, um, this is another, you know, rabbit hole, but, you know, people always correlate money with success. And, you know, you, you're then going to have everything sorted. And I think all of those examples that you just mentioned, I don't think those people wanted for much from a material probably manner. But it's interesting yeah. how, you know, that's not the case, you know, and I think that's what we constantly on this hamster wheel about making more money or being more successful in our workplace. And I'm mentioning that because obviously that's, you know, the topic for today is like mental illness and health in the workplace. And I think people are always stuck on this. And, and you know, I've always had a, I wouldn't say a giggle because it wasn't funny when it was happening. But, you know, all of these deadlines are like, sometimes it's so fictitious, you know, it's a, just a deadline just for the deadline. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and that really plays on people. It's like, why do I have to get it done like today, you know, at four o'clock on this day? Um, and sometimes there is valid reasons. I mean, <laughs> you're going to get fined if you don't submit your sales returns. I mean, I get that. But it's other, other ones, I mean, it's, it's interesting. But um, so I like the celebrity aspect. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I do want to go down. You know, you said something very interesting just as we started speaking, you know, just before the episode about how people confuse illness um, and health. So maybe take us through, you know, your thoughts around that. Yeah, so, you know, as, as you probably know, or, um, or you might not, but I run a series of workshops and they all relate to the subject of mental health in the workplace. And I've, you know, I've tried to explain this to so many people, but sort of, if you can think of it as an umbrella, I refer to my workshops as mental health matters in the workplace. Matters serving a dual purpose in terms of the word. Matters could mean issues, but it also means that mental health matters. It, it should be a concern. So it's got a dual meaning. So I've got the umbrella of mental health matters in the workplace. But one of my, I actually refer to it as my flagship workshop, has the title Understanding and Managing Mental Illness in the Workplace. And that comes under my umbrella of being a mental health matter. Now, the reason, uh, as I said, that this, these terms have been confused, um, I had a previous marketing partner who, in their wisdom, sent out the topic of that workshop as understanding and managing mental health in the workplace instead of illness. 
and it made such a huge difference. I was actually extremely annoyed. I think it went onto my website and it went out and I said to them, why did you change the word? And they said, well, I don't know. I think they said they didn't, they, did, they weren't paying attention, but it changed everything because that workshop is about understanding mental illness. Mental illness is a topic all on its own. And in that workshop, I talk about the mental illnesses that you can expect to see in the workplace, like your depressive disorders, your anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I also include a little bit about schizophrenia, which is not a common mental illness in the workplace because it is one of the more severe illnesses. Uh, people with schizophrenia can work, but often they don't, especially as they get older. It's kind of a degenerative disease, if I can call it that. Um, so that, that whole workshop is talking about the illnesses and how to manage them in the workplace, whereas mental health covers a much broader spectrum. All my other workshops fall under that, like building resilience, uh, the power of being assertive. Um, and now I've just gone completely blank when I can't think of burnout. That's a mental health concern. It's not actually a mental illness. Um, so mental illness is just one part of mental health. And if you want to manage mental health in, in, the, in, in your workplace, what you're going to be doing is very different to what I'm talking about in my, in my workshop about mental illness. So we've got to understand that mental health is a, is a big global term and everyone's talking about it. We need to be more aware of our mental health and yes, we do and healthy living and um, managing the, the organizational strategies to limit the, the risk of burnout. These are all mental health concerns, but mental illness is another topic um, and it's, it, I, I, I think it's an extremely important topic and, and I hope we're going to talk more about it because there is so much misunderstanding in, in, in the, if I can call it the lay population when it comes to mental illness. Uh, and I see it all the time in the workplace. People, people just don't get it. Everyone knows what it means to be paraplegic. You know, they can see, they can see while well, the person's in a wheelchair, they can't walk, they've got no function from the waist down. You know, these things, you know, we can see them. When it comes to mental illness, people just don't, uh, a lot of people just don't get it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, there's an important difference between health and illness. Yeah, um, um, so uh, we definitely going to go down that route. And, and more, um, you know, what I want to, oh, you know, what uh, Shaz and I really want to get out of these uh, shows as well is, uh, firstly, people get to know Leslie Burns. Um, and secondly, that they know that they're not alone. Um, and, you know, our favorite thing with the show is that Google is not your friend. And it's because people don't know what to ask. You know, it's like, you know, you can go into Google and what do you put there? You know, that'll help me explain to my HR manager that actually I'm really struggling in the mornings and I can't really get going. You know, what would you put in Google? But hopefully, you know, someone would have listened to this and, and resonated with, it, with even the topic and listened to it even partly and said, ah, oh, I really like what Leslie was talking about. You know, like, can I reach out? Or, you know, at least it points that person in the right direction. Okay, maybe an occupational yeah. therapist can probably help me. You know, I'm, I'm based in like somewhere else or something like that. But that's what we want to get out of it. And, and you know, yeah. if we achieve that, I think that would be amazing. Um, but I do want to ask. Elizabeth, if I, if, if I, before I forget, you, you just touched on something. You know, when I, when I do my workshops, I... I use a lot of analogies to, to physical illness to try and help people understand. And you just said uh, that thing about um, if they go to their boss and say, you know, they're really struggling to get going in the morning. Uh, and that's a classic uh, problem in people with, with the depressive disorders. And there's lots of reasons for that. It's a, it's a symptom and it's also a side effect of the medication that they take. The analogy I often make, and people's eyes just light up when I say this, but Asking someone with a severe depression to get out of bed in the morning is like asking a paraplegic to stand up. That is how difficult it can be for someone with a depression. And the, the really, I, I literally, not so much on Zoom, I don't see my audience, but when I was running the workshops pre-COVID, I'd see people's eyes going big and people nodding their heads and saying, oh, really? Is it, is, is, can, it, can it be that hard? Um, and to try and get this message across to the managers, um, 
who, you know, someone with depression is coming late for work every day, they get disciplined. Uh, someone who's, who's paralyzed, who's coming late for work because they've had catheter problems or bowel management problems, get all the sympathy in the world. Again, it's about understanding, and that's what the workshop on understanding mental illness is all about, about trying to help HR managers and any kind of managers, supervisors, team leaders understand that this thing called mental illness is a very real thing. And, and, and yeah, the, the, the responses are amazing. They, they really do just start to get it. And those analogies that I use between physical illness can help quite a bit. Mm. I'm, I'm glad you said that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm actually, as, you, as you're speaking, you know, there's so many different aspects, you know, we can go down here, you know, we can go down from an employee point of view, we can go down from an HR point of view, we can go down from a manager point of view. And, uh, you know, I come from an environment where I don't think, you know, when we were speaking to an educational psychologist about ADHD, you know, in adults as well. And I told him, I never heard that term. I've been over 22 years in corporate and I never heard anyone from HR, any employee of or team member on my team come to me and tell me they struggle with ADHD. Although you can clearly see that some people did. Uh, you know, Shaz has a, has a saying around bipolar as well. And you know, there was some, like a good friend of mine, you know, he ended up being diagnosed with like bipolar and you could clearly see, you know, there were issues, you know, but we didn't know what it was. And I promise you, no one actually, you know, picked it up. We just knew it was like a bit weird, you know? Um, but how would you, how would you help maybe from those three aspects from an, from an employee point of view? I mean, what, what, what would you normally tell the employee? And, you know, we don't have to keep it too long, but, you know, you know and, and we, we definitely will link to your workshops as well, because I think this is the next level. You know, obviously we can't cover mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. in the time that we have here, but uh, we want to be able to give you, you know, give anyone that's listening to this, uh, you know, a quick espresso shot of, you know, what Leslie would actually offer to that person uh, and yeah. what this possibly could entail. And then I think from an HR point of view, um, because I mean, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, because my question would be, is are, are organizations equipped to deal with mental illness? Because I don't see any psychologists at, at companies, you know, some yeah. companies do have ICAS, you know, I think our private schools are probably more equipped, you know, to be able to deal with mental Ill illness, because, you know, most of them have at least an educational psychologist on their payroll. Uh, I don't see many yeah. companies doing that. Um, and then lastly, I think from a manager point of view. So I'll leave that to you. Yeah. You know, you mentioned ICAS, and I wasn't sure if we were allowed to mention other organizations this morning. Oh, but but, <laughs> I, so, I but I'm glad you did. Yeah. I'm glad you did, because I've actually got a note somewhere uh, down here about, um, you know, uh, one of the things I was thinking about is do employers really care about the mental well-being of their employees and and the, the, the straightforward answer to that is some do and some don't and I think what I'm experiencing at the moment in, in my own in my own marketing efforts is that a lot of companies do have the service of ICAS which is a, a which is a, a, a as you probably know it's a service that's available to all their employees and even their families if they're struggling with issues they can go to ICAS but I fear that a lot of people don't make use of that. Um, there's, there's a lot of fear about being found out at work uh, that you have a mental health issue. Um, and this all comes back to stigma, uh, which unfortunately prevails still very, very strongly. I mean, people are saying that it's, it's getting better, but it's, it's definitely still there. And Although COVID has helped people in a way talk about the importance of, of mental health at work, I don't think that it's really done much to reduce the stigma. And if anything, people are being even more quiet about their struggles now because jobs are on the line. I don't know how many um, hundreds of thousands of millions of people in the world have lost their jobs in the last two years. So obviously people are going to, be wanting to protect their job as much as they can. And if they think that they're gonna be frowned upon because they go to their HR manager or their line manager and they say, look, I've been struggling with depression. If they think that there is any chance that that's gonna put their heads first onto that chopping block, they're not gonna do it. Um, 
what I've also experienced in, in organizations, and I hope I'm sticking to the point here because I, you know, I do have so many thoughts that come into my head. I think I've also got a bit of ADHD actually. I think I always have, but I've never been treated for it. Um, I think it needs to start at the top. Um, I don't think it can just start at middle management. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage organizations to go right to the very top and get the, and start working on the stigma from the CEO of the organization. Because when everybody else realizes that the CEO is on board, that's when people are going to start talking about it. And that's when the stigma is going to go down. That's when awareness is going to increase. There's going to be more empathy in the workplace. There's going to be more support. And we can make a big difference. Um, I'm not sure if you've uh, uh, ever heard of a guy called Chuck Robbins. Um, I don't expect you have, but he's the, CEO, he's the CEO of a company called Cisco Systems, which is an information technology organization that's based in the US. And it's got a total, well, a couple of years ago, it had a total of approximately 75,000 employees worldwide. And Chuck Robbins, uh, who's a fairly young CEO, um, you know, he's, I don't know how old he is actually, probably in his 40s, maybe even his early 40s. He, he was in a conversation with someone, I think, I don't know if it was a colleague or a family member, but he heard about someone who'd committed suicide and it really touched him. And what he did was he sent an email to all 75,000 employees of Cisco, simply saying that we need to start prioritizing our mental well-being. And within, I think, 24 hours, he had about 100 responses, which is not a lot out of 75,000, but it's 100 more than would ever have happened without his email of employees actually talking about issues that they were having. And since then, he's had many more. And I think he's a standout example of what top people in organizations need to be doing. Unfortunately, the argument that I'm always faced with when it comes to that is CEOs don't have time for this. Um, but it's just, it's not that they need to attend the workshops and go and talk to everyone. They just need to have their face on the issue. The, CEO, the, the employees need to just know that whoever that person is, is on board and it will filter down and, and people will start talking about it and employees won't be suffering in silence. They will feel that they can go and talk to their, their whoever is, um, their reporting line requires them to, to talk to. And mm. at the same time, where if, 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 the, if everyone else can start to understand what mental illness is, they'll be able to re respond appropriately. And they won't say things like, oh, shame, that's awful. Just, um, I'm sure if you have a cup of chamomile tea every day, you'll be fine, you know, and such things, you know, or, you know, you must just cheer up, you know, you've got so much to be grateful for. It's, it's not like you've got cancer or something. Uh, you know, these kind of comments that I, I've heard over the last 20 years coming out of, of, of people's minds. So, yeah, uh, I don't know if I'm sort of going off the track, but I, I don't know if that answers your question. I'd be welcome to, to just... Mm. Uh, yeah, that was perfect. Me back in. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I mean, I do have... A, I, I see uh, Shaz does have a question as well. But um, my thought on this is um, it's almost like, you know, so lots of... I think even CEOs, I mean, I, I think there's lots of people. I mean, I don't think there's one CEO that would say that their people are not their biggest asset. I mean, everyone says that, you know, it's like the, the cool thing to say. Um, and I think there's a, that leadership, if you want to call it that. But I think how it filters through, I think when we get to the day where I can say, you know, in a corporate environment, actually, guys, I've got a therapy session between 10 and 11, and I can't attend that meeting. I think when we get to that yeah. stage... You know, when someone can like say that without the risk of, you know, no job promotion at the next one, you know, yeah. without the stigma of someone like, you know, like having some weird thoughts around that stuff. When we get to that stage, then I think almost the system is working. And I yeah. almost see, you know, that's where it kind of works. And, and you know, we, we mentioned ICAS. Uh, so we don't have a rule. We know we're not promoting ICAS per se. I don't know anyone in ICAS. I just know it's one of those uh, places and, and I think you know what you said is very true I think not many people use it um, and I don't know the answer to this question because I don't know for instance does you know if if I as an employee went for five sessions that was allowed you know for me for some mental illness does that ever go back to my manager 
you know, does it, you know, because obviously someone has to sign off on this. It said, you know, I went for five sessions, you know, how does that reflect? And I think what you're saying, Leslie, has lots of merit. And I think there's, I mean, it's such a big problem um, or here, yeah, you know, big topic that, you know, in my mind, I don't even know how you would attack it. You know, I don't know, except for that awareness part, uh, which is what we're trying to, you know, bring through with the show, is that for, for employees to know that actually, you know, you, you do need to be speaking about this, because if you don't, then you're talking about Robin Williams type scenarios. And even if it's not as dire as that, you know, there's the, there's the, you know, the breakup of marriages, there's dysfunctional families, there's all of those kind of things that, you know, is a side effect, and you don't even know it's happening. And that's why I'm a firm, firm believer in like, everyone should go for therapy, at least instance, not all the time. But if you're struggling for something, go for therapy, you know, uh, or go see uh, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and saying that you've got a, a therapy appointment with your psychologist on Thursday, and you can't go to the meeting should be as easy as saying that you've got a therapy appointment with your physiotherapist, because you broke your leg five weeks ago. Um, you know, the no one worries about saying that. And, and, and I can't wait for the day uh, that, that we do that we do get there. And just to answer something else, um, Oliver, about ICAS, it does get back to the manager. I've seen a lot of uh, disability claimants who have been referred to ICAS and their managers are always aware of that. Um, you know, they're, they're line managers, uh, their team leaders, their supervisors, everybody generally does know. The colleagues in, the, in their team don't necessarily know about it, uh, but their managers do know about it. So yeah, that fear is is it's big. Yeah. So they they rather just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that people might even be more prone to finding their own therapist out of work, uh, so that they don't have to um, uh, have their managers be aware of it. Yeah, I mean, I, and I'm I'm talking from personal experience. I mean, the first time I ever did therapy was exactly like that. You know, did it you know, after working hours, and I don't think I felt comfortable enough, you know, in the space, because, you know, and, and that's my thing yeah. with corporate is, I mean, and that's, you know, what you were saying about CEOs and, and upper management is, it's a nice story to say, but there's a certain image that you need in corporate to be able to be perceived as someone that you can, they can depend on, you know, for the next promotion, for taking a senior position in in a team, in a company. And I think the almost like the whole system is flawed. You know, there's there's few countries, maybe companies that get this right. But but um, someone mentioned to us, you know, with our own companies as well, it's like, you know, he said, um, but you know, this just seems like a lifestyle business. And for me, it's like, yeah, damn straight. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> you know, it's like we get to choose, you know, what we want to do, you know, the clients we want to work with. Whereas I think if you most look at most companies, they have to report to shareholders and the shareholders, you know, I mean, how yeah. do they gauge, how do they gauge whether they're doing a good, good enough job is by the share price yeah. or the performance of the company. And that filters yeah. all the way down to the poor employee who might have that mental illness. And I think, yeah. you know, and I think that's the part, you know, I haven't seen, and that's why I was, you know, when she has mentioned your name, I was like, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe someone will actually you know, take back the curtain and tell us about companies that are doing this really well at the moment. You know, maybe, maybe mm. we just don't know it. Um, mm. And I think there's companies that have maybe that people management part. Um, there's companies that have HR, um, obviously. You know, lots of companies have HR. Um, but I, I just find that function probably is not equipped to deal with the, the pressures of what business is about. You know, because at the end of the day, something has to get done. And that something has to get done by someone. And if that someone has a yeah. mental illness, who does it? Um, yeah. So it's about getting the balance right, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, for any organization, doesn't matter how small you are, you can be a one-person show like like I am. But return on investment is 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 why you're doing it because you need it. You you need to produce because you need to make money to survive. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the point of, of business. And I think, um, you know, what I'm about is, is not, not, not ignoring that at all, uh, not for a second. I mean, that's, you know, we start talking about special accommodation of people with, with job accommodation of people with mental illness. 
um, that's a, that's quite a big topic all on its own. Um, and I always emphasize that the, the, the very first and most important consideration is that whatever that special accommodation is, it must not place the employer under any undue hardship because there is a job that needs to be done. So for example, I mean, I hear people saying that um, someone who, who, who suffers from, let's just take an example of someone who suffers from a, a debilitating anxiety disorder and now they can only work half days. They can't work full days. Now that's not reasonable. Uh, we talk about special reasonable accommodation because what's the employer then supposed to do with the other half of the day if that person's only working a half day? So, you know, there's got to be a lot of consideration from both sides. Um, and, you know, I'm all about um, just making workplaces more, more aware, more inclusive, more understanding, more empathetic when it comes to having people there with mental illness. And, and, and again, to understand it, you know, if you've got a mental illness, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't do your job. You know, these, these illnesses are usually um, relapsing, remitting types of illnesses. So people can be absolutely 100% for a long time. We just need to look at these celebrities that continue to perform and excel in, in sport and in music and in acting. All these people I mentioned earlier, they just have moments when they're not functioning. And it's that, that's when, when employers need to be empathetic and supportive and understand what's going on. It doesn't mean that they're going to now be like that forever and they must get rid of them as quickly as possible on the grounds of incapacity. Um, that's possibly one of the, the biggest myths of all in, when it comes to mental illnesses. These people, they, they can't work. They must go. Uh, you know, it's a bit like being epileptic. You know, you're not epileptic all the time. You know, you're not having a seizure all the time. You're, you're having a seizure maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, maybe less frequently than that. And in between your seizures, you're absolutely fine. You're just as good as the person sitting at the, net, at the desk next to you. But you do have a condition that, that comes along from time to time and, and uh, you know, affects your ability to work when it does. Uh, Leslie, there's two things that you said there that I really think are important. So the first one is almost that accommodations thing that has to be fair on both sides. So using mm -hmm. an example, I have a friend who does have a mental illness and severe social anxiety. So the company, you know, because they had to disclose to their HR, the company gave the concession that they could work from home, which is great. That solves the social bit and it solves the you have to get through traffic and be at the office by eight. But on the same hand, this person's then pressured by the team leaders to join the year end compulsory lunch. And I'm going, so HR is saying this person suffers from severe social anxiety. We don't have them working in the office for this reason. But the team leader is going, okay, I need you to be at the team lunch because it's socially, you know, you have to be there. And I'm, so I do get that you, know, you have to somehow bridge that gap that HR is able to educate the line managers, the team leaders, et cetera, to go, this person's not avoiding you. They're not being nasty. It's not that they don't like, it's that they can't function in a loud group of people and a year end party is a loud group of people. So that's the one that I really love that you mentioned. The other one that I think is very important is that we do need to break that stigma. We do need to be able to have more people understanding, like you say, that depression or anxiety or these things, it comes in bouts or in waves. A person's not always going to be so depressed that they can't get out of bed, but when they are in that state, what is the concession as an employer that you could make to ensure that, you know, this, the company still functions, but that this person's able to actually come back and feel like I can say to my line manager, listen, I'm taking a mental health day because, well, quite frankly, I can't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that's where we need to get to. Yeah, just... It, it, uh, with that, uh, regarding the stigma there, just like the person who has an epileptic seizure would have to phone in, or they probably wouldn't phone in, probably someone who lives with them would phone in and say, look, so-and-so's had a seizure, 
they're in a they're recovering and they won't be in today so um that's that uh, regarding that team lunch shares, uh, it's so interesting that you mentioned that, but I've got a real live case that I did a, a couple of years ago um, of, a, of a person who, who was diagnosed with uh, social anxiety disorder. It's one, of the, the, it's one of the four most common of the anxiety disorders. Um, and her manager forced her, said you will come to the, the Christmas lunch or whatever it was, and if you don't, we're going to punish you and we're going to take a day of annual leave from you. And I just thought, you know, if ever there was an example of lack of understanding, that must have been it. I can't remember what she did. Um, I can't remember if it had happened or if it had been threatened um, in this particular case, but I just thought, you know, um, yeah, just, you know, just people not understanding. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I'm so glad that um, you answered that like you did, uh, Leslie, and also that she has brought it up. Because, I mean, my question would be, you know, going with that train of thought earlier as well, is if the next promotion came up and it was the person that went to the party or it was the person that stayed at home, who would that promotion, everything else being equal, who would that promotion go to? You know, and, and yeah. I think that's the part around the politicking and the rest of it that maybe, you know, corporate is not, you know, like, yeah, it's not yeah. quite, and it, it, this is a human thing. I mean, I'm not saying anyone gets it wrong. I'm just saying, you know, from my experience, that's how it seems to work. Um, yeah. And you know what I found, I would love to know your thoughts on this as well, is because you mentioned the actors and it got me thinking. What actors do really well, and I think even sports um, personalities seem to do this, maybe not the really driven ones, but they seem to take a break in between stints. You know, they, they don't do movie, movie, movie. You know, they might do movie, movie, break for a year, you know, movie, yeah. movie. And I think from an employment point of view, yes, we have our annual leave and stuff like that. I find most people don't take that really well. You know, they don't know how to manage their leave. And because you need at least two weeks, you know, proper like downtime. And this is where you don't get a phone call. So we have a rule when you're on leave, you know, I almost like disable email from certain people definitely shares because then she wants to check emails and stuff like that. So I actually just remove email. And it's like the weirdest thing is because when people say, you know, the chairs leave, it's like, uh, no, actually she just went on leave. But I know you can't like stop yourself from doing that. So I like, you know, I, I just remove it, you know, remove accessing yeah. it. Um, but yeah. this, you know, so do you have any thoughts on that? Um, because then the, where I want to go as well with this is, how can you, or what can we say to employees in terms of if they do have that mental illness, how would they, in a mature way, approach that with their boss or their manager? Well, again, I mean, in an ideal world, they, they, would, they would approach their boss just as they would if they had any kind of other illness. Um, and and they, would, they would say, you know, they'd, they'd explain what their symptoms are um, you know, that they're, they're, you know, the symptoms of, if we talk about depression, the symptoms are physical, psychological, and cognitive. So they'd go there and say, you know, from a physical point of view, they're, they're constantly tired. They're, they're uh, getting, they often get aches and pains and, and, and all of that. Psychologically, they're just feeling down. They're feeling emotional. They're feeling irritable. Uh, from a cognitive point of view, they're feeling they, they can't concentrate, they're, they're forgetful, they can't make decisions anymore, they can't solve problems, uh, they, they just can't focus their attention and they, they'd explain it all to their, to their manager. The, the problem is, and again, this is where the, the, the education comes in, is that the manager's gonna be listening to this and thinking, well, really? You know, I also feel like that sometimes, so what makes you different? Um, and this is why they don't go and tell them. If I can make the analogy again, if you go in, you've been off work for, for, for six months because you had a catastrophic motor vehicle accident and you lost an arm and a leg, you don't need to explain all of that. You know, there's no, you know your employer can, your manager can see it. Uh, that obviously, you know, it's going to take you longer to get going in the morning. You're going to have to go to your therapy appointments and there's lots of sympathy. Uh, there's lots of accommodation. Uh, don't worry, 
there's almost too much sometimes that it gets taken advantage of. You know, just come to work when you can. And, you know, if there's anything you need, come and ask us. But for, for, the, for the person with the, with the mental illness, that's where the challenge starts, right there, is that they're going to try and explain something to a person who's, who's going to be listening to them and thinking, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I, you know, is this person putting it on? Um, but it's what they've got to do. They've got to, you know, there is a responsibility on, on people with the mental illness to help other people understand as well. Uh, there is a responsibility on them, but there's, there's so much fear about it um, at work. They, 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 they can be very good at explaining it to their family and, and even their friends. But when it comes to work, there's, there's, there's more at, at risk there. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a difficult one, you know. And in terms of what the HR person should be saying back and how they, or the, or the manager, what they should be saying to the person is, there's all sorts of things that they should be saying and that they should not be saying. For example, don't say that chamomile tea is going to solve all your problems and everything's going to be fine. Um, but they've got to understand that. So, you know, it's really the, the approach should, should be just like it is for anything else. If you're at work and you're not feeling well, you need to go to whoever it is up the line from you and explain it to them. Um, and you've got to hope that they understand it and, and are supportive and empathetic. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. Um, and I've, 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 I'm working my way through companies, trying to give them some more of those skills that I think. Are you guys still there? Yeah, there we are. <laughs> I think we probably just had a little break there while my UPS kicked in. I didn't think we were having load shedding today. Anyway, let's not talk about that. I've actually got a, a when it comes to job accommodation, I've, I've listed uh, eight items and it's according, it's called load shed. So the first one is line of reporting. The second one is uh, LO, um, off time. Uh, a is assistive devices, D is uh, duties, and I've done it all according to load shed because that's a little bit what special job accommodation is. It's about shedding the load from the person who's not well to allow them to continue to perform their role in the organization without the organization suffering. So I just thought of that now when my lights went off. So is this a, um, is it a PDF checklist or something that we could put and offer a, something of value to someone around that? I could turn it into that. It's just on ah. one of my slides. Ah, okay. um, that would be amazing. Uh, it's, it's just in a table, but I can certainly send it to you and you can, yeah. you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love that idea. Uh, so I think uh, let's do that. I mean, Shaz can work with you on that, but let's put that sure. into the show notes as well. But again, it's that's something tangible which is really cool. I mean, I think you gave us already some really good pointers from an employee point of view, uh, you know, from an employer point of view. And I would say, you know, from an employer point of view as well, as long as you know what the outcome is that you want to achieve by, you know, this year or something, then you're matching the resources based on that. Um, because, you know, as you were uh, saying, Leslie, you know, about, you know, going to your manager and, and putting down all of these things that are wrong, I'm just thinking that's such a, that's like evidence for a incapacity case, you know, um, and there's that level of honesty and, you know, like, um, almost like you, you know, you're putting it out there that you're hoping the other person and being the word I'm trying to think of is vulnerable. You are being vulnerable and you are, you, you, you know, putting it out there. Yeah, you definitely are. You definitely are. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just a very difficult situation. Yeah, and, and the stigma, you know, we must remember that stigma comes in, in two forms. It comes in, in the form of a public stigma, so the people looking at the person, but there's also a self-stigma, uh, and it's, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Uh, so people frown upon you as having um, characteristics that they don't admire or respect, and that's what stigma is. And then the person uh, takes on that and starts believing it. And they actually believe that they're not worthy. Mm. And so mm. now you're asking that person to now go and expose themselves to, to someone senior to them. It's, 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 yeah. it's a scary no. situation. 
Yeah, and and I think we can't. I mean, I can't. Um, you know, without having a, you know by having an expert like yourself on board uh, for this episode, I can't not ask this question. I mean, with COVID and you know, there's such a drive in South Africa at the moment for everyone going back to the office, and you know, most of the big corporates have already mandated you know certain timelines in which that's happening. How should someone actually deal with this? Because obviously, you know, people have, I think, you know, the other thing about, you know, what you mentioned, I can only work half days. So, you know, because of the mental illness I have, what the last two years have probably shown people is that there are options to be able to make money, you know, as in to have a job or to do something that's not just dependent on going somewhere to, you know, a cool building. And hopefully that's, that kind of is hitting home now, but do you have any thoughts for people that are struggling now to to almost like get back into the zone of going back to the office? Is there anything that you have around that? Yeah, you know, I, th I think this is a very tricky situation for us at the moment. Um, not only here in South Africa, but across the across the globe. Uh, so many people before COVID, and I, I used to hear people saying this all the time as well, whether it was due to any kind of mental health issue or a physical health issue that, or even, even due to no medical condition at all, there's always been so many people who've wanted to work from home. It's always seemed like a very attractive thing that they can work from home. They don't need to struggle in the traffic. They don't need to get dressed up. They can just, you know, and they can look after the, the kids and there's all sorts of benefits. And I think what COVID has shown, it's, I think it's shown a couple of things. I think it's shown that working from home is a lot more possible than anyone ever thought before. Um, but I've, I think it's also shown that it, the, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people now who are dying to go back to the office. They want to get away from from the the, the, the the confines of their house. They want to get away from their children and their partners. Uh, they, want to, they want to even sit in that traffic again uh, and have that alone time uh, that they never thought they'd miss. But that time when they listen to a podcast or just listen to the radio or just have some thoughts for the day, pe people are even craving that again. And then, of course, you've got people that are very anxious about going back. And I think employers have got a huge challenge on their plates. Um, and I, I've been reading a, a few um, articles about the issue. And I think employers need to make an effort to really explain the pros of going back to the office. I don't think it can be a case anymore of you will just come back because that's how it used to be. Uh, because you're going to have employees saying, but hang on a minute, that's that's not a good enough reason. I've been working perfectly um, productively for the last, how long is it? It's almost two years. I think it's, it's about 20 months. Uh, why do I need to come back to the office? So there's, there's, there's employers out there that need to start making it very attractive to come back and, and putting in the effort. And, and I think that, that, that will help. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a difficult one. If if people don't want to go back, how do you how do you convince them that they have to go back? Um, I, I think I think this is a challenge facing so many employers and employees at the moment. And uh, for people who who suffer from some kind of a mental illness, it could be a great time to motivate that they don't go back if they have been productive. But I mean, it depends on that. How have employers been measuring? Productivity. I've heard some disastrous reports of, of people working from home, from organizations saying that things just aren't getting done. Uh, um, and then I've heard some very good reports as well of, of people excelling. So I think it's, it's very much a, a conundrum for employers. And I think it's got to probably be managed on a case by case basis. Can we just have this, this blank rule again that we're a, we're a company with an office in, in Santon, and that's where you go to work every day from Monday to Friday from 8 to 5. Um, you know, we've got the hybrid working situation as well, so that's something that needs to be negotiated. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's very much a case-by-case, case, individual by individual, organisation by organisation. A lot of dynamics need to be worked through in terms of negotiating this mass return 
Um, and I think we're, what we're going to see is a lot more of the hybrid working situation where the, we've learned now that there's, there's not as much need to, to be in the office all the time. But there are benefits. It's a bit like with my workshops online. I can do it, but I would much rather do it at a venue where I can see the people that I'm talking to and people can put their hands up and ask questions and the collaboration that the workplace allows for needs to be considered. So, yeah, tricky one. I love the way you put that about it is going to have to be a lot of different considerations in order to bring the mass return to the office to the forefront but on what you were saying about you know, it's been nearly two years do you think that in the last two years of the whole worldwide pandemic and people working from home and that kind of thing that you know, there's become a little bit more awareness from managers line managers HR of people within organizations that could be struggling with different mental illnesses or just their general mental well-being I think, they're, they're, I think they'll probably have been, look, I think that can work both ways. Um, I, I think it's also been easier for people to hide um, because, you know, if you're suffering from a mental illness and you have to go to an office every day, you've, and if you're symptomatic, you've got to put on a show uh, and try and conceal it. Whereas if you're at home, it's easier to conceal. Um but there, there will be certain things that have, have certainly been picked up uh, by, by managers. You know, just the, the, the thing of let's take a Zoom meeting. Um, and I think the, the, the introverts have been differentiated from the extroverts uh, through willingness to participate in Zoom meetings. There's a lot of people who will not put their cameras on um, and, and who, who want to, you know, and, and other things have been picked up on Zoom meetings. Um, that that wouldn't have been picked up otherwise. But um, yeah, shares. I'm not. I'm, I, I, I suspect that it, it has probably worked both ways. It's also been easier for people to hide away. The only measurable that employers have had is is, is output, isn't it? And um, you know, some people have responded very well to the working plan, like I said a few minutes ago, and some people haven't. And that's what I suppose they've been they've been measuring on. Um, uh, yeah, this this world of, of remote working is, I think we've still got a, an awful lot to learn about it. I've actually got a friend who's working remotely for an international organization and the, the, the monitoring systems that they've put in place to make sure that he is at his desk and actually doing work for eight hours a day are, are remarkable. I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit over the top of my head. You know, as I said, I'm not an IT person, but the, the measures, because a lot of people have been getting away with, with a lot, I think. Um, I love your approach, you know, and, uh, and I think, you know, your approach is not just, because I, I see these posts on LinkedIn, you know, and it's always, you know, it always seems to take the, employees aspect to it you know yes you know it's it's going to be such a drain to be in traffic and i like how you pointed out you know the positive parts to it uh, which i actually do not the two hours i mean i would never do that <laughs> you know two hours from pretoria north into Santon, that's going to be crazy there's no way i'm doing that uh but you know the half an hour i normally get a podcast in or I'll listen to audiobooks or something like that and you know what what you mentioned which i haven't seen on any of the posts and on um and maybe I haven't looked enough, maybe, but is how do you measure the productivity? Because again, I'm going to put the employee hat on now and say, you say you're more productive, but how is that translated from a company point of view? Because obviously then over the last two years, the company should have seen a lot better growth. You know, let's say we've been 12, you know, maybe it took us three months or six months to hit zone. So maybe over 12 months, you know, the company should have seen better performance. Is that the case or not? Or have we seen the same performance, if not worse? Because if that's the case, then, I mean, I think your argument is going to go out of the window to be able to justify, I'm actually better at home. Because I hear, I mean, I've, I've heard the stories as well. You know, someone told me, as an example, I can't even mention the names now of the companies because that would be a you know, giveaway. But, um, you, know, where, you know, she just checks in in the morning, you know, like just to check, you know, what are the emails and then like goes and does whatever she wants to and then comes back like two hours later and then checks in 
you know, and, and that's the part, unfortunately, that how do you, how do you check that? And you mentioned yeah. the systems, you know, we used the system and it wasn't for checking up. It was more for looking at productivity. And, um, you know, what the software you used to do is it would take screenshots like every five minutes, you know, to see yeah. exactly what, what are you doing? Um, but then someone has to go and manage this. <laughs> like, and that was me. Yeah. And there was no <laughs> way I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go see what she has to do every five minutes. I mean, that, that would be like such a waste of yeah. my time. Um, but that's what the level you need to get to now. But, but again, what, what signal is that, you know, sending out? It sends a signal that actually we need to police employees to be able to get the best productivity. And yeah. is that the type of employees that, that you really want? Or is that the company that you want? I mean, uh, yeah, it's such a, such a tricky one. But I, I love the fact that you firstly mentioned that. And I, and I love the fact that you mentioned the positive aspects. Because I do want to say this, and I would love to hear Shaz's thoughts on this, because she kind of was you know, with us through all of those changes. You know, what I found in corporate is that you almost like never switch off. And so for, for some time, we actually created the rule that when you leave work, you leave work. You know, I don't want you to check email. I don't want you to answer a phone call. I'm not going to phone you. Um, you know, and, and that's an opportunity that I think employees in a remote setting probably, they don't realize that this is happening. Because going and checking email at eight o'clock in the night or nine o'clock at night, Although that counts towards your productive time, I don't think that's the best case for you from an ill, you know, from a health point of view. I mean, uh, that can't be good. No, it's it's not. And if I can just jump in before Shaz, there's, there's been there's been a lot of blurring between home and work life because now every everyone's at home, so the office is also at home. So there's been a loss of that that cut off which I think is so important. I, I couldn't agree with you more on that, that, that there has to be work time and then there's home time. Um, and uh, even before COVID, when people were still working in offices, there wasn't enough of that because people kind of felt that they could phone, they could phone you at 10 o'clock at night, even if it was just for something that could easily have waited until the morning because you're at such a level in the company that you must now be available all the time. But now that people's offices are right next to them in their living room or in their dining room or for some people in their bedroom, um, that that cutting off has has been has been very much blurred and and people have been very stressed by that. They feel they feel. I mean, again, you you get both ends of the continuum. You get the people who take advantage and just don't answer their phone or check anything and just have taken a big gap for twenty months. Then you have the other people who are just constantly feel like they're working all the time. It just never stops. Um, the the and 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 the managers need to 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 look at that. You know that you can't expect the person just because their computer is right there and they're sitting next to it while they're watching TV in the evening. It doesn't mean that they actually want to go and do something with it. They've got a family and they've got a social life and they've got other things going on. So uh, it's been it's been something that I've done quite a lot of online uh, sessions on is just how to get this this balance right between work and home when work is at home uh, mm. and it's it's difficult you know it's, it's not something I, I've worked from home since 1998 uh, so I mean it's not something that I personally relate to because I've, I've been doing it for more than 20 years but it's quite a thing to adapt to if, if you haven't and for that reason the, there are people who are crying out to go back to work back into mm. the office and yeah. you feel that there, there will be a lot less stressed. Mm. I, I love that you said that. Um, and, and I think it started with cell phones. I mean, for me, that's when it started, you know, that, that blurring of the lines, you know, where and I, I know like I refused to get a cell phone initially. And I think my employer eventually is like, I want to call you. So here's your cell phone. It was, you know, and, and you got kind of got sucked into that that thing right. um, but the reason I'm saying this even before Shest, uh, you know get, we get uh, Shaz's take on it was uh, I think I read an article recently where Portugal passed a law that employees employers are not allowed to call the employees after hours and I think that's <laughs> kind of going in the right direction now because that's been abused for so many, you know and, and the argument is but I'll pay your cell phone like yes but you don't pay for the time when you call me at nine o'clock at night that's not cool um and i think yeah that stuff should automatically stop i mean and okay. you know, 
I've got a saying, unless the building's on fire, don't phone me. And I, 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 do, the, I do the same when I go on annual leave in, in, from, from my house. Uh, I, I say to whoever is looking after it, listen, I don't want you to phone me and tell me that, I don't know, that something minor has happened, that if, if, if my house is burning down, then you can phone me. Well, obviously, I need to come home. But for anything less than that, please just deal with it. That's why, that's why I'm leaving you in charge, you know? Mm. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's finding capable people to do that. But I think it's such an easy one where people and there's there was this I mean, I, I don't do that anymore. But uh, there was this thing that if you someone sends you an email, you have to respond in 10 minutes and like or, or half an hour, an hour or something. And it's just something about even email. Uh, people have that now with WhatsApp and SMS and stuff like that. You know, if they send you a message, you have to respond straight away. Uh, and it's it's almost like we're creating the issues, you know, and we are getting worse over time. Mm. But Shaz, I have to ask you, because, you know, when you joined us, that was the mentality. I mean, Shaz used to work weekends. And it was just like, I think, the environment that she had before. Um, and eventually, I had to actually, actually create the rule. Actually, I don't want to get messages from you on a weekend. Um, and it's this like almost like this thinking that you're doing more uh, if I'm getting an email from you after hours or over the weekend. Mm. Look, yeah, when I first started, remember, I'd come back from, I'd come in from a very rigid you know, call center type thing. And, you know, we worked weekends and that kind of stuff. But the other thing is, is I've always had a fairly good work ethic. Uh, but even if started at eight, if I could only be there by six in the morning, then I'd get into the office and I'd start at six in the morning. Um, which then also kind of translated when we had those three months we were working from home. I mean, my wife's been working from home for years. So she's got this whole routine. You know, she gets up, she does what she needs to do. She has breakfast, then she works. Then she steps away from her desk, goes and has lunch, comes back to her desk and carries on. Meanwhile... I will wake up, sit at the desk, and there I'll go. And then the end of the days come, and I'm still going. And eventually, it was in the last sort of three weeks of working from home that I got into that habit of turn the computer on at seven, four o'clock, you end the day. And because it does, with it being at home, you just always switched on. And yeah. you're not actually more productive because you're always switched on. There's a greater chance of actually making a mistake because you haven't had time to kind of wind down. So I think it's very important to actually learn that methodology. And I do now, I'm a lot better at it. I don't actually deal with work after hours unless I happen to come across something, but I'm not deliberately checking my email or checking yeah. my if something come, if I come across something, then I might respond. Otherwise, I kind of put a mental, that's the first thing you need to do tomorrow morning. And then I don't like to be disturbed before sort of nine o'clock because I've got that list of these are the three most important things that need to be done today because they carried over from yesterday. Okay. And you know, Shaz, just talking about that as well, when you sit down uh, and you just go, 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 that's the other thing that we that people have lost from the office is the general sort of moving around and general sort of chit chat in the office that provides a bit of a mental break from your work. You know, just even getting up and going to the coffee station, and while you're there, you have a chat with a colleague, um, and it could be shooting the breeze about uh, some movie you watched last night, or it could be something a little bit collaborative that you're struggling with at the time. All of that's been lost. So people, they're just, it's just them and their computer and they're just sitting there all on their own. And um, yeah, as you said, shares as well. So it's, it doesn't mean that you're productive all the time, but you're at it all the time. Mm. Um, There's yeah. something about that change that is amazing. And I think Shaz and I, uh, last week, for the first time, we did a, like a walking meeting, you know, just down the road, you know, just off, you know, just went for a walk for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes and came back. We were still chatting, but, you know, that felt good, you know, to be able to yeah. do that. I think something yeah. like that. And there's a change in environment. Um, and someone told me this about gym as well. You know, like, you know, why, why would you go to the gym? There's something about that mindset, you know, like, because when you put 
you know, your trainers on and you go to the gym, you know, you're at the gym, you have to do something. And then you get out of the gym, man. <laughs> you know, whereas everyone kind of like, no, no, let's get this machine and that machine and I've got the weights, but then you never do it because it's just yeah. that mindset is just wrong. You know, it's just yeah. that part. Um, yeah, but absolutely. Leslie, on your side, you know, from an employer point of view, should they be doing like, I don't know, are there checks that they should be doing with their employees? I mean, how, how, how would you almost advise around that? Yeah. How would so, they um, yeah, mental health checks, uh, like they do annual physical checks, you know, an annual physical check, as we know, it's, it's, it's a bit more straightforward because it's, it's, it's all sort of objective stuff that they do, like in the mining industry, you know, they, you have to go for your annual medical and they check your, they listen to your your heart and they maybe send you for an EG, they do a stress tolerance test, they look at your weight and your BMI, and it's all it's all very objective and very easy to do. And I was talking to a, a chap actually just a couple of weeks ago who's recently retired from uh from from uh ESCOM of all places, where he was a uh he's actually an industrial psychologist. And uh he was talking to me a little bit about the issue of psychological safety um, and, and what needs to be done around that. And I think, I think there should be checks that are done on an annual basis. Um, I don't know if you, if you remember that airplane crash a couple of years ago with that pilot that drove his plane straight into the Alps. I think it was the Alps or it was some mountain range. It was about five years ago. Uh, and it was a passenger airliner. There were a couple of hundred people on board and he drove it straight into the mountain. Uh, uh, because, and it turned out with the investigation, it was, a, it was a suicide. He wanted to kill himself and he took down everyone that was in the plane with him. And there was a whole lot of talk at that time about what was the airline doing or what could they have done to have picked up on the fact that this guy was so severely depressed. Um, and, and could this event have been prevented? I, I don't know the outcome of that. And I don't remember what the airline was either. It wasn't SAA. Um, but yeah, uh, the, 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 the should, I believe there should be mental health checks on an annual basis uh, in many industries. I'm not saying it, it's something that would need to apply to every single working person in every single environment. But certainly in some, I think there should be. Um, and I suppose it would fall into the, into the repertoire of, of, of someone like an industrial psychologist. Um, it's not something I'm doing, just to, just to put that out there. I don't, I don't do it. Maybe an organization like ICAS needs to be looking at something like that. Uh, even, even a questionnaire um, to start off with. But again, you know, you're going to have your issues of confidentiality again in terms of, because a lot of, almost all of, 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 of mental illness is subjective. You have to get the reports from the person. We don't have the luxury in, in mental illness of, of x-rays that show up that, yes, the arm is broken and this is what we need to do to fix it. Uh, there's very little of that in mental illness. There are some scans that can sometimes provide a bit of an indication, but, but generally it's very limited. In, in mental illness, you're relying on the subjective reports that come from the, 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 the person and their significant others, um, their family, their colleagues, their friends. And then you're relying on the psychiatrist's expertise as a, as a diagnostician. Uh, you know, with his 10 years of training that he can take that information and with his experience or her experience, make a diagnosis and know that there, there is something wrong. So I think, uh, you know, I looked at that question that you sent me and I wrote down a few things this morning and next to that question, I just wrote, yes, uh, mm -hmm. I think there should be. Um, mm -hmm. I think there should be some kind of mental health and, and, and psychological safety pre preventative measures put into workplaces and i think i think that's something that needs to be worked on absolutely yeah. i love how you related it back to the mining industry and you know maybe what you you know by you, what you're implying by that as well is the more regulated we become with this you know the more um you know so you almost need to mandate to people 
how they should and and again this is i mean it's such a political thing now uh, or social you know because now we're talking about standards of you know how you tell people what they need to do and we can think of like the recent vaccination kind of you know dramas around this as well uh, but um you almost like need to tell people you know like i need you to do this check or I, this is how it needs to be done um, and the mining industry, you have to do it from a safety point of view, you know, but it's mandated into law and that's how the mining companies, if you want the, the you know, the, the rights to, to mine, then that's what you do. Um, so it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, you know, the one, I'm a huge uh, Linkin Park fan um, and, you know, so the ringtone on my, on my phone is one of their songs, you know, um, but I remember, I don't know if you guys ever watched this, but uh, um, so James Corden did Carpool Karaoke before he sold it to Apple. And he did, um, one of his guests was oh, Lincoln so Park. You know, this was um, before Chester, the lead singer, committed suicide. And it was one week before Chester committed, committed suicide. And if you if you ever watch that, I mean, you know, it's actually quite unnerving that you, know, you can never see the signs, you know, one week before he actually did that. And that's how close sometimes you are to that moment. And I think from, uh, you know, tying it back to the question, you know, if we can pick those signs up and help people better, uh, because we know it's stressful, <laughs> you know, like everyone doesn't, everyone says the same thing, you know, working, you know, life, the whole thing, this, this stuff is stressful stuff. You know, how do you help those people? You know, we, we talk about stressful jobs, you know, air traffic controllers, you know, like um, whoever sets off the dynamites in mines, <laughs> that must be hectic, you know, but, <laughs> um, you know, all of those things, we know that, but how, how do we help yeah. them? How do we know? Because at the moment it's more reactive. It's like, okay, tell us when you have a problem. Sometimes they don't really know they have a problem. Yeah, it's about looking out for the signs. And and so often um, you, you uh, I would say as often as nine times out of 10, people that I've spoken to who've had a friend or a family member who's committed suicide, they, they so often say, I just had no idea. Um, and, I, you know, I've, I've had some very distressing stories recently. Um, a 25-year-old young man, a 13-year-old child, uh, and the parents in both cases just saying, you know, uh, how could this have happened? Um, I think the problem is when it comes to suicide is, and I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit wary of how to say this because it's been you know it's not always completely impulsive but when it actually happens, I think there's a degree of impulsivity at that moment when people commit suicide and that's what takes people's breath away. So it's not that they didn't know that they were depressed or that they suffered from or they were being bullied at school. But it's just uh, they didn't think that it was going to get to the point where they'd actually kill themselves because I'm not sure that the people who successfully do it plan that far ahead actually. And I think I think there is a degree. You know, I've had I've had this debate with myself. What's the difference between suicide and dying with dignity? I don't know if you know about that organization, Dying with Dignity, where people can go to Switzerland or Sweden or wherever it is, and they can. Be, or assisted dying, it's called. Why, why is it called assisted dying, which sounds all very nice and, and pleasant why, instead of suicide? Because essentially it's the same thing, isn't it? But it's a lot more planned and there's a lot more uh, sound reasoning behind assisted dying, isn't there? I mean, the, the, the person knows that they are dying anyway and they want to save themselves and their families of the suffering that they're going to go through. Whereas someone who commits suicide is not dying and suddenly they're dead because they've acted in such a way. And, and, and the stigma associated with that, that, well, that's a topic for another day. But yeah, it's, uh, and suicide rates have never been higher in the world than they are now. And that was before COVID. Um, they, were, they were record highs. Uh, it's, it's a very distressing, it's a very distressing situation. And if we go right back, uh, Oliver, to your question about mental health checks, uh, the workplace is a great place to do it, and and you never know you never know what might be what might be picked up, um, and and prevented from those. I did a workshop a year or two ago, and there was a lady. It was actually took my breath away. It was on Zoom, and she 
she actually told me of, of one of her employees who had committed suicide just like a week before or something. Um, and when we finished the, the workshop on understanding, and she said they had no idea that, that such a thing could happen. And when we finished the workshop, she said, actually, having learned about the signs and symptoms, she said, actually, he was demonstrating those signs. She just didn't know it at the time. Not that it would necessarily have made any difference. You know, people, when they, when they want to do that act, you know, they're going to do it, you know. Um, but, yeah, very distressing when we start looking at suicide. Mm -hmm. Very sad. Um, yeah, I, I didn't actually know that, but uh, at a recent uh, coffee and smoke break, uh, Peter Shaz and I were talking about a topic that's similar. Like nice and morbid like that as well <laughs> but obviously we have to pick up the we can't leave it on this note but uh, no that's not yeah that's not. but uh, but it's an actual you know real thing and i think you know we're pay painting the dire condition of you know what it could be and this is not you know i think what we're saying is it's not uncommon firstly and secondly we all know this is we all know people are struggling so how would you help people because we know they're struggling and sometimes it's even asking the question and spending half an hour and just asking, are you really okay? You know, is there anything I could do? We, you know, we had a social worker, I think it was Sally Baker that was on. And she just said, you know, sometimes it's doing the most simple things. Uh, this was about, you know, birth trauma. We were talking about it, but I can even apply this to, you know, like even, I mean, if you, if you were really serious about your team, about their well-being, you know, sometimes it's just doing the simplest thing. You know, just buying, you know, a Ferrero Rocher, you know, get it pulled on the company, yeah. you know, but just saying thanks or something like that. And I just find sometimes that's not done enough. You know, we say thank you, but sometimes it's so quickly, you know, thank you, you know, rather than yeah. actually maybe just or taking you, them out for lunch. Or even just picking up on, a, on an observation. And, and we all know that we observe things. And in South Africa, it's, it's how are you? I'm fine. Thanks. How are you? You know, and then we move on and get on with the day. Just to pick up, are you sure you're fine? You know, you, you don't, you know, are you sure? You can tell me. Little things like that, but, you know, that can also go a long way. The mm. Ferrero Rush is good too. Uh, <laughs> I'm a great fan of chocolate. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good taste in chocolate, obviously. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. And someone, I think it was a salesperson that told me that because I was, you know, we, we always think these elaborate things, you know, like, oh, no, I need to get the perfect gift. And, and she said, you know, for her clients, she just buys like a, a Cadbury slab every year. And she says, you won't believe how grateful they are for that. I mean, they signed another yeah. contract, but they're just grateful for the fact that, you know, she thought about them. And she drove yep. all the way to give them <laughs> this lab of chocolate, which is, I thought, yep. was amazing. But yep. Chez, on your side, I do want to wrap it up now. I think we did an amazing job at this. I, I, I think we could probably, and Leslie, you know, time willing, uh, I think we probably didn't do, do as, ju as much justice on the, the mental health part. I think, you know, the mental il illness, you know, we covered really well. But I like what you said about burnout and resilience and stuff like that. And may maybe we can spin that into another discussion, you know, if you're open to that, uh, you know, on, on those specific cases. But um, I love this conversation. I mean, I, I don't want to obviously put too much out there, but it's it's enough that someone can put, you know, that can resonate with the message and say, yes, this is for yeah. me. And now at least put a name to it um, and say, okay, cool. That's the rabbit hole I'm gonna go down. But Shaz, yeah. on your side, is there anything that we, that we should have asked Leslie that we didn't? About that. I think we covered as much as we could on this topic. It, it is such a huge and such an important topic that I definitely think we could spin it off into another episode like you say about resilience or burnout or you know yeah. even the dark dire suicide preventions um ptsds that do affect people within the offices so i think we could definitely spin out into other episodes but we've given enough of at least umbrella information for people to start going okay this is where i am maybe this is the route i need to look at for help Mm. Okay. And I think okay. we were being ambitious with it as well. And I think it's, um, so I don't, uh, I feel, um, I think it's, uh, yeah, hats off to Leslie for the job that she does, because you're dealing with so many different audiences as well. You know, you're dealing with the employee, you're dealing with the HR practitioner, 
you're dealing with the employer, you know, maybe executive management, if you, if you want to put that in a separate bracket. And I think it's difficult yeah. to get the messaging unless you know who the audience is. And I think we tried to cover multiple aspects in this discussion. Um, yeah. But Leslie, on your side, anything that we should have asked you? Uh, no, I don't think because... so. I don't think so. Um, I think I think we've. I feel that we've kind of covered a lot of of, of what I was expecting uh, based on, on on the on the brief. So uh, I think, like Shay said, it, it's it's a massive topic. I mean, I, I can always talk more. We've but we've you know that's our time, and um, I'd be more than happy um to to do another episode as i said you know i i like talking about this I, I'm, not, I'm not morbid but i i believe that the more it's spoken about the more it can improve um and that's why i do what i do um so yeah i'm very happy to to schedule in another episode in the new year if 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 you want to so i, I thank you again for the opportunity to to talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah no we we definitely want to do that so if that's a question yes <laughs> so jez will schedule that in for us um and as i was stumbling over the words there i was going to say you know if, you know if the wisdom that you offer and the angle that you're taking from a healthcare practitioner perspective because we have a huge amount of respect for healthcare practitioners um i think is amazing and i think uh, you know just so just putting the Thank topic you. out there is really cool for us and um you know we always and you know that's one of the reasons we want to do this is you know you said um you know about the topic you know for us we i think there's there should be more a space for more intelligent open conversation and some people are not going to like that and that's okay but i think there's lots, lots of people that are yearning for that conversation that you don't see that you know being discussed so although we're talking suicide you know point me to five resources right now that employees can go to to find that you know five proper blog posts and i would struggle i mean i could ask other clients as well but I, yeah. it's one of those taboo topics that people don't talk about but it's real it's happening yeah. you know so we ignore yeah. um i mean but, while we've been having this this conversation i'm not sure there's, there's a suicide in the world something like every is it every 30 seconds or something like that at the moment so i mean i'm not, I'm not great with maths but you know you just have to think how many people have i think it's every 40 seconds how many people have committed suicide just while we've been having a conversation so mm -hmm. yeah anyway we don't want to end on that morbid topic yeah, uh, yeah we, we said that twice now so like but it is a so, it, it's a reality and it's it, mm -hmm. it's yeah people people want to talk about it actually because it's one of those flummoxing um phenomenon in, in the world still even though it's happening more and more people still why why do people kill themselves mm -hmm. yeah well but it's been I a think... great pleasure meeting you both thank you yeah no thanks and it, the, you know the pleasure has been all ours uh, i think uh, you know great job again from shares uh for identifying you yeah. firstly and then getting you on board because i think it was amazing but uh, what i want to say with that last point um, to end on a on a positive one is you in the right space. I think you know, although we're not calling it you know that morbid topic or we're not going down that route, by talking about mental illness and talking about mental health, I think you're pointing us to that direction that everyone needs to be talking anyway. And and more than that, and I think that's your OT hat, is you making it actionable and tangible. And I think yeah. that's amazing. I hope so. so. Thanks for what you do. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Oliver. And, and thanks for organizing, Shaz. And uh, have a safe and happy holiday if you're lucky enough to be having one in December. And we'll catch up in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always, stay tuned and we'll speak to you in the next episode.